uh, so that everyone can learn. So everyone can learn from one another. So let's um, come to this program with an open mind of sharing and engaging. Thank you. Charles. Yes, I, just, I just want to support what Elizabeth is saying. Uh, in some of the previous presentations we did, we sometimes picked up very interesting things that we haven't thought of and that we could also now apply in our institution. So it is a learning curve for us and you. And I hope you enjoy the course. Thank you. And you can always put up your hand. Uh, I will try and uh, navigate that. Uh, but there is an, quite a number of you here. So Elizabeth, do you want to start with your uh, presentation? And just tell me when you want to go to the next slide, or I might just do it for you. Okay, no problem. I will let you know if I want you to tap uh, or to move over. Uh, Again, thank you and welcome to today's presentation. My role now is just to refresh your mind if you are not from a data background about the basic information of data collect, uh, data collection and analysis. Next. Um, I like this quote from Jim because he says, if we have data, let's go with that. If all we have is our opinions, Let's go with mine because gone are those days. And I think that is what Sia Pumelala is about. Uh, gone are those days that we deal with our own intuitions. We rely, we need to start making data driven, data informed, or data guided decision making. Next slide. So the outline of my presentation will be I'll talk about the role and the importance of data. Uh, the ways that we can collect data and analyze the data, uh, the importance of disaggregating that, in, that data and why is it that important. Uh, and also I'll use some of the use cases that we have from UWC. Next. All we know that nowadays we produce vast amount of data on a daily basis. Even in our institutions, we do that. We collect a lot of information from our students through our student administration systems, through surveys, also data that is collected by external uh, service providers, as well as researchers or companies out there that are doing surveys on our institutions. It is very important to acknowledge and know how to use that data to drive decision. Data is very important because it can help us to set the realistic goals in terms of our institutional goals. All institutions nowadays, they go into strategic plan, planning and they come up with this um, strategic plans. In those strategic plans, we do have indicators that we need to track. If you don't use data to track your strategic priorities, that your um, institutions will not be in a competitive environment. When we have data, it can also help us to make those unbiased decisions. In cases where, uh, gone are those days where we used to do uh, blanket approaches in terms of interventions that we are offering because we didn't know who our students are or what their needs are. It can also help us to stay abreast of what works and what doesn't work so that we can change in terms of processes, practices, policies. And also it can help us to track, uh, to track improvement in terms of performance, institutional performance, and more especially in terms of student success performance. Next. We know <laughs> when we work with data, we need to also acknowledge that we need to summarize that information or make sense out of it. And the one important thing is for your institution to grow in its maturity in terms of data, you need to have several steps. And here we're looking at the data analytics maturity because the higher you move across the data analytics steps or processes, the higher the value of your analysis will be. And the more you move towards the more complex data analytics uh, activities or techniques, the more difficult it can be. But we also encourage in Siapumelela as well that we also need to look at our own institution and acknowledge where we are in terms of the data maturity. For example, 
the most of the time we spend um our 80 percent of the work that we do in our institution in a descriptive analytics we need to start moving towards looking at diagnostic um, analytics where we look at what did happen and interrogate that data but more specifically we need to also move with now with new technologies that are coming on board generative AIs or any any AI that are out there. Now we've got chatbots and all that. They also help us to optimize the processes within our institution by also aspiring to um, be at the prescriptive analytics where we can look at what can we do to improve our processes. Next. When we collect data, we need to also be mindful of the type of data that we are collecting so that it, we can also know how we're going to be analyzing that. It is very important uh, to know um, the different types of data because for different type of data, you need to apply a different techniques in terms of how you're going to also analyze data. It is very useful for decision-making uh, you need to also make sure that your data is complete, it is accurate, it is timely, as well as it is actionable and reliable. And those different types of data that you need to collect, usually we classify them into two. We do have other data sources that you can also, or data types that you can also bring into the mix. But here we're going to be talking mostly about the primary and the secondary data. In terms of the primary and secondary data. So primary data would be data that is already existing in your system immediately. Secondary data will be data that you will go and source out that is not available at that point. For example, data that you will get from your surveys. But also most mostly you need to also understand that those type of data that you are collecting, whether are you collecting it, is it numerical data or is it categorical data? When it's quantitative data, usually we also collect it from your student administration systems like your marks, your uh, student performance, your learning engagement uh, metrics that you get from your LMS system in terms of the number of participation or the number of uh, courses that the students have uh, participated in and so on. In terms of other qualitative data that we collect from surveys would be when we ask questions, so, um, in the survey in terms of how long um, have you taken to study or how long have you prepared for the examination. Those kind of numerical information, we call them quantitative data. We also do have qualitative data, which most of the time we really don't collect and um, analyze it, including also the general comments that students um, put in the surveys. We need to find time and efforts in terms of analyzing that data. But when you have the data, you also need to think about the ways in which you need to analyze it. You need to think about whether do you just want to describe it in terms of descriptive analytics, or you want to make assumptions or test some assumptions in terms of inferential analysis. And there are different ways that you can look at it, in term, including also looking at the correlation or also the comparison of different groups of students. Next. Once we have collected the data and we summarize the information, we need to also think about how do we identify gaps within those data. And one of those ways is by disaggregating the data. The purpose of disaggregating the data will be to reveal the underlying patterns or trends that are within your information. For example, if you disaggregate your data, you will be able to see whether the performance of males and females are different, and also is the gap between males and females performance higher or, or less, or are they performing at the same, same rate? And you are able to also put some measures in place to address those disparities as well. Okay. So we encourage you, it, through Sia Pumelela, we also encourage you to also disaggregate your data by looking at demographic information, but not only just the demographic, with other metrics, including also other variables that you may collect in your data, including your school quintiles, including the types of, um, the types of uh, programs that you have, including also the type of um, qualification, like for example, mainstream versus uh, 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 
uh, mainstream versus foundation or ECP programs and so on. But also when it comes to the demographics, we also do acknowledge that some universities have homogeneous uh, data where you also have just only majority of your students being black. Therefore, you cannot try and disaggregate that data because then you won't find the relevant insight because some of the groupings would be of a very few minorities. But we encourage you to use some of the demographics or also create some sort of personas, which also helps you to disaggregate the data in terms of the relation between different kinds of people. Also, it will allow you to look in depth in terms of uh, the different categories of your different groups um, that you will be analyzing as well. And it will also provide you with measures of effectiveness and equity, because gone are those days that we always have to look at equality, because we also do, uh, in our institutions, we always do blanket approaches in terms of interventions. And when we disaggregate, we're going to be creating those holistic, personalized interventions for our students. Thank you. Move forward. And yeah, I'm going to talk about some of the use cases um, that we have seen over the years. When we started with Sia Pumelela project at UWC, one way that we, we use the data uh, was to identify the high priority modules. It was just to visualize um, and look at the pass rate and also looking at the enrollment of different modules. And for us to also come up with the definition of that high priority module, we needed to also understand the data by putting them um, on a, um, a graphic or a visualization so that we can see where and which of the top highest uh, modules were having challenges within our institution so that we can address that. And this was one form of the visualization that we used to identify those high priority modules. And in order you, you don't know the definition of high priority modules, those are modules with high enrollment and um, low pass rate as well. And we also look at the trends. It's also important to look, not only just looking at the descriptive in terms of looking at the individual module and comparing different modules, but you also need to look at one module and take it through um, over a period of time, over, over time so that you can identify the trends. And this is one of those modules that we looked at that had uh, a low percentage uh, in terms of pass rate. And when we look at the trends of that module, the uh, ethics 111 module, we saw that this module was not performing above 80% over a period of um, more than five years. Um, and that is the reason why we also selected this module as one of our high priority modules that needed attention, because looking at this trend also told us that we need to pay attention to this um, data by disaggregating in this manner. Next. Also, uh, we took that same module and look at the performance of different um, groups of students. In, uh, we disaggregated it by, by gender so that we can look at the performance within this module so that we can pinpoint where the actual challenges are. And when we disaggregated this information, we could see that the male students were performing at a lower uh, rate than their female counterpart, even over the period of years. Um, it was not just a once-off instance. And hence, in this year, uh, in our Siapumela 3.0 at UWC, um, gender e equity is one of those projects that we are trying to also emphasize on and try to um, address the uh, differences between males and female uh, gaps. And this is one of the examples that I can also share with you for today. Next. That is the end of my presentation. I just also want to encourage you later on, um, after we've done with the presentation, myself and Charles, we're going to be looking at the case studies and we're going to break you into groups um, some of you will go into institutional groups um, where we're going to discuss three different case studies. And each group can also select 
which case study they want to um, discuss. We have three of them. The first case study is about uh, making sense of module success. Uh, we have part one where we look at the deficit-minded uh, professor. We will give you time to read through the case study, and then you're going to have a discussion around the two questions. How should Ruby Naidu and others on the team respond to Dr. Kuzia's comment about the overall pass rate being an acceptable low level? And these um, case studies are there just to help us, to guide us in terms of when we go back to our institution, how do we engage with the data that we have in our administrative system or the, the data on the um, KPIs that we use, key performance indicators that we use in Siapumelela? How will they guide our discussions in our own institution? And these are some of the questions that you can also use um, in your discussions. How can the team members be encouraged to reflect on the data and try to make sense of it? Next, Alan. The second uh, uh, case study is about a data skeptic. We also know that in most universities, we do have those people who are data skeptic. So uh, this one case study, it talks, uh, uh, you will go engage on topics uh, about data skeptic, where you will answer questions around how would you respond to Mr. Stain, who is a data skeptic, what additional data might the team request from the Institutional Research Office to address mistaken um, concerns rather than asking, far, uh, asking for more and more data? How can the team and the how can the team have an open and productive conversation about that conflict with an anecdotal um, understanding? Next, the last. Case study is about uh, having a multivariate thinking, which we encourage that everyone who lives from here will have that kind of uh, thinking. Uh, how would your team respond to Dr. Nell's contention that you should expect some variation in module outcome? Do you agree with his statement? What is the problematic about Dr. Singh suggestion about analyzing controlling for race, socio, uh, socioeconomic status, gender, quintile of school, and other students' characteristics. So you will engage in those three conversations uh, in your separate discussion uh, breakout sessions, and we will come back and feedback. Thank you, and I'm handing over to Charles. Okay, uh, my mind just started running when, when uh, Elizabeth was presenting. It's very interesting. Well, it's one thing to analyze the data, but when you take and present it and the reaction of people to the data and some of the comments. I remember years ago when for the first time I did throughput analysis in the university and I presented it, uh, there was a lot of shock in the throughput rates of some of the qualifications. And... As I left the room after my presentation, one of the academics turned to me and said, please stop analyzing those throughput rates, <laughs> which is not going to help the institution, but it was interesting to note. Okay, I'm going to talk about the context of university, the data in the big picture. The data analysis is moving beyond compliance's only focus. Data analytics plays a critical role in informing student success interventions. Uh, we all know that we do success rates and throughput rate analyses. We often have to present data to academics and administrative managers for planning purposes, for decision making, uh, and also to identify problematic areas. Uh, some of our institutions have developed early warning and tracking system. Our own institution developed the RADAR system, which is a very user-friendly system for lecturers, where they can see uh, the performance of the individual students. They can see how the student is performing in their module, and then also in other uh, modules in the qualification the student is taking. 
and then they can interact with the student and perhaps call them in to talk about it or send them to some workshops or send them to support systems in the university. Uh, very useful uh, uh, system that we've developed. It's especially used by the academic uh, advisors to identify students that are at risk. It also, as Elizabeth has also indicated, the data assist us in identification of problematic modules or programs. Normally, uh, one can start off by looking at the throughput rates of qualifications and those with very through, low throughput rates. You can then go and look at the success rates of the individual modules in the program and look which ones are actually causing the students to not complete their studies and then develop um, interventions based on that. We can identify variables that impact on student success. Uh, as Elizabeth has mentioned, things like quintiles, school, schools, uh, background of students. Um, sometimes it's even lecture connected, etc. Uh, in my institutions, for instance, we've got summer and winter schools. If students get a second chance during the recess to redo a module, we only have it for some of the modules. And you sometimes find that it's a different lecture and the, the whole program is compacted uh, in one or two weeks, the, the module, and then suddenly students do much better. It's either, could be two factors. The one is that they can focus just on the one module, or secondly, it's a totally different lecture. And sometimes that makes a huge difference. We also collect information through focus group interviews when we identify problematic modules to get feedback from students, how they experience it, what are the, the things that, that they think hinder them from succeeding, etc. And then predictive analytics, which was also touched on, um, where we actually almost want to predict how a student will perform based on some on information that we have on the student and then to intervene timelessly. And then the more complicated one is to look at the impact status of student success interventions, uh, which I'm not a big uh, boffin on, but there are people that are good with these kind of things to see whether an intervention has made a difference. Normally we just look at whether the performance has gone up, uh, but there could be other variables that uh, are influencing that. Thanks, next. Now, I just want to show you an example of the use of student success data, and it's not, it wasn't a major science breakthrough, but it was just something that bothered me. I, and this was quite a number of years ago, and then I'm going to tell you the interventions that we eventually implemented to make a change. We had the lowest success rate in the Faculty of Law in 2014. But at the same time, I noticed that the Faculty of Law had a very high student-staff FT ratio at the time. And I assumed it contributed to the low success rate. So what I then did is I thought, okay, I want to see how other faculties of law uh, are comparing with our Faculty of Law. But you know that the faculties in the different institutions are composed very differently often. So what I did is I worked out a national average student staff FT ratio per season, um, the classification of educational subject matter for contact only universities, because we mainly are contact university. We've got like 20 distance students in one master's program. And the student FT ratio was calculated to determine what the ratio for each faculty would have been if they had the same ratios as the national averages. So first of all, I break down the enrollments in the faculties by season category, the FTEs. Then I worked out what was the student staff FT ratio for the contact universities that I compared with and applied that to those season categories and then worked out what should our faculty student staff FT ratio be if it was on the national averages. And then the law faculty was way above the national average when I looked at that. Next slide, thanks. 
Here you can see uh, the law faculty had a success rate of 65% compared to education, which had one of 89, health sciences of 84. So it was really the lowest success rate in the university. The next slide. And then what was the FT student to FT staff ratio? in 2015 and 2017 and then the national average in red now the yellow is what it was in 2015 uh oh i think that, that some of the faculty names have disappeared but the law one is where the arrow is you can see it was 51 in 2015 then it shot up to 67 in 2017 where the national average was 37. It was almost double the national average for contact universities. Thank you. The next one, Alan. So what did we do? I presented this to the deans and during the budget allocation process, when they decide on the allocation of the amounts to the faculties, which is based on a RAM model that we have, which the departing point is the income that the, each faculty generate that I calculate for them in terms of subsidy and fee income, and also research uh, research outputs, teaching uh, inputs, teaching outputs, fee income, and then what was also done in the Faculty of Law is uh, we then appointed with Siapumilele funding academic advisors and uh, introduced student coaching. And we also uh, used the radar system to identify which students are at risk in the law faculty. Now, after I did that presentation to the deans, it was decided that 50% of the budgets allocated to faculties will now be based on the variances from the national averages for student staff FT ratios for contact universities. So the law faculty obviously will now get an additional, quite a, a substantial additional allocation in the budget so that they could appoint more staff members uh, to get closer to the national average. Next one. Now, what happened after that? The law faculty immediately showed the biggest increase in retention of first time entering students. They had improved success and throughput rates. And based on the success in the law faculty, this academic advising intervention or student coaching and radar were rolled out to all the faculties. And it has led to a more equi equitable allocation of funding for the appointment of academic staff. I've presented this when we were got a, received our audit from CHE and some of the people on the panel got so interested in this that they contacted me afterwards because they're also now using it in other universities, this way of budget allocation, um, because some of them had ratios of 100 to 1 in some of their faculties because the sometimes the 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 deans with the biggest and strongest voices get the biggest budgets, and it's not really based on date, proper data analysis. Now, what happened here? The success rate of the Faculty of Law jumped from 65% in 2014 to 75% in 2019, which is better, much better. Next slide. And also what happened, the retention of, if you look at the 2017 first time entering, returning in 2018 was 84% in the law faculty. And in 2018 to 2019, it jumped to 91. A huge difference in retention of the first time entering students. And we know that is the point where we lose most of our students when they enter the university from the first to the next year. Thanks. Next slide, Alan. Now, this is the Faculty of Law, the student staff FT ratio and success rate of 2022. You can see the recommended ratio for the faculty. You can see there what I do. I take the SESMs, 
I worked out the enrolled FTs. What is this? What proportion is this of the total faculty FTs? And then what is the average ratios for the other contact universities? And then I work out a recommended ratio, which is now weighted based on the SESM enrollments in the faculty. And you can see the recommended ratio was 38. And because of this budget intervention, quite a number of years ago, our faculty of law is now at the same ratio as the national average and the success rate in 2022 was 75%. Next slide. I think that might be the end. Yes. Thank you, Alan. So yeah, now we're going to the case studies, I think in, in uh, breakout rooms. Um, we can just... yeah. uh, before they go to the breakout rooms, uh, in the resources, if you scroll down, Alan, a little bit, there is a case study. If you download, click on the arrow, it will download the case study. And these are the three case studies that you're going to discuss. We'll give you some time to read through. I know and realize that some case studies are longer and there are some guiding questions which are similar to what I presented earlier. And the first case study is about um, we're trying also to have an authentic scenario here. Is the uh, is about make uh, the deficit mindset pro uh, minded professor. I'm not going to read it, so you're going to read through it in your breakout rooms. I don't know who creates the breakout rooms, uh, Ashton or. Yeah, Ashton will do it. We we would like to put you into groups of your institutions. Uh, and if there are, and one breakout room will be the ones where there are a few people. Does that make sense? And then can you just remind us how everyone can link to the case studies? Is that in an email that was distributed, I assume? The link. Yes. The link is in I'll put the link again in the in the chat. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, I've created the breakout rooms per institution. I've assigned it for 30 minutes. So we're ready to go once everybody knows what they're doing. Elizabeth, do you want to just say again what people must do? Okay, in your breakout rooms, you're going to choose one of the case study. You can, uh, there are three of them. So we're not going to um, select which one each institution is going to present you can choose for yourself. Uh, and then you have 30 minutes in that to read through and also discuss the questions that are on the case study. There are some guiding questions, but feel free to also discuss any points that might arise from reading the case study and from the engagement. Then we will have, we will come back to the plenary and do a repeat report where we'll just do um, key takeaways from those discussions. Thank you. So uh, Ashton can put up the um, breakaway rooms for you to join. Okay, people will move automatically to their rooms. So I'm creating them now. Okay, thank you Ashton.
So everyone is back, I think. And um, we're going to have a 10 minute break. So shall we be back at 25 past? Okay, thank you. Is twelve back? Shall we just ask for volunteers that wants to make general contributions? I, yeah, because I think we have eight groups. Okay, so eight. Yeah, we can take eight. I think. Yeah. Um, At not long window, just saying one primary takeaway. Yes. yes. Susie is asking a question from you, Jay. Um, well, it's not a question. It was just to basically volunteer to start the feedback. Okay. That's okay. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I have a very succinct takeaway. And um, we looked at two two scenarios thanks to Elizabeth, Elizabeth because our group is very small and we already start stopped talking halfway through and um, so we looked at two but my takeaway and our group as a takeaway is really whenever you're referencing anything related to data in a team always be inclusive of people's opinions and interpretations of that data so that the point is keep an open space for interpretation and be inclusive and secondly take things step by step when explaining anything related to data because how you approach it the methodology, the tool, et cetera, is all valuable in deciding how you respond to it at the end of the day. It can actually be the difference between somebody blowing up and storming out or actually people sitting together and really understanding something and taking it forward to make a real difference at the institution. So take it step by step and be inclusive. That's my very succinct takeaway. Thank you. Next hey. volunteer, anyone? Uh, it's Unisa. Unisa. <laughs> Yeah. Um. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good luck on the Monday here. I hope I'm audible. Um. Our key takeaway was that, uh, and we looked at um case study number three. We had a huge pro. We we appreciated the pragmatic views of one of the professors. The other professor, uh, or, or Dr. Singh. Uh, we felt that. Uh, the opinions, the strong opinions, were really founded by uh, opinion, and 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 uh, all the, the the views were founded by opinion, and the and the disregard for the pragmatic views of Prof. Nell were very problematic. And our key takeaway is that um, we we as, as a data team, our approach should be to encourage the academics to really seek the truth in in the data. Right? Let us seek to quantify the extent to which these attributes influence student success. Let's seek to leverage machine learning techniques, for example, to perform feature importance exercises so that we understand how highly correlated some of these profiling attributes are to a student's success, and then provide feedback and say, this is what we found, and as a result, we should take this into consideration and not just assume that uh, we can just make the uh, these dynamics uh, disappear. But ultimately, our, ours is not to control uh, the outcomes, but to really influence interventions. Because once we've identified the key attributes that have the the, the, the negative impacts on student success. That should influence the generation of ideas around what interventions should be put in place in order to enable all students to succeed at the, the, the same level. Thanks, colleagues. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah. You can go ahead, uh, WSU. Can I go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, the major takeaway here that we have is that um, one needs to understand the context <clears throat> of their own institutions. Institutions are different in terms of the type of students, the location, and the structure, and and other influences. And one needs to understand those. Uh, so that you can understand the type of data that you want to bring into the table in, in dealing with uh, uh, success and pass rates. 
And also, once you understand that, it allows you to do a, a proper aggregation in terms of um, understanding the different types of, 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 your, of, your, of your students and the factors that affect them. Um, so that um, you, you can take that into account when, when, when dealing with um, um, issues of intervention, because uh, they will be affected differently. There's issues maybe perhaps around uh, and as far as there will be issues around um, uh, accommodation and transportation to and from campus, uh, things that maybe um, are not um, 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 of concerns to other uh, other other universities. Um, and also, once you get your aggregation uh, uh, correct, you are then in a position to be able to do a comparison. Uh, you can do a comparison from department to department within the institution, or you can look at uh, uh, different, um, I mean, similar departments um, and in other um, similar institutions to see where, where your performance is at a, a sort of um, a national level, so to speak. And uh, also, it is also important to look at historical data. Um, to see um, what are the changes throughout the years and what could be the influencers in that. Um, um, in universities, we go through um, um, changes. Um, those changes, you need to understand how they affect your, 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 your performance. And therefore, um, maybe in future, when, when changes are coming, you can be better prepared to understand what kind of influence they will be having and so forth. I think from all that is all. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, SMU, you can go ahead. Thank you. The first case study, and we try to respond to uh, Dr. Kwetia's comment there about the overall pass rate being acceptable at six, at sixty percent. And um, firstly, we thought that um, well that. 60% may seem fine at face value, but this view is a little problematic because um, it is a surface reading of the data and it hides the disparities between the different demographics. Um, for example, we saw that uh, the blacks and the colors were doing badly as compared to other racial counterparts. But why is this fine? Why is he saying, well, I can't help it? It, it seems as if uh, he's abdicating his duties um, there and it's it's a little problematic there and um, the other thing is that we we saw that uh, Dr. Gutierrez claimed that the students are underprepared. Well, you are seeing this, but what are you doing about it? Um, so what are we doing about it to develop the students to be um, at equitable success uh, success success as compared to um, the other races? And um, the other thing that we thought about was why is sixty percent okay? Why is sixty percent pass rate okay? What informed the, the, the view that 60% pass rate is okay? We need to interrogate this. I mean, um, if, if this was once investment and you lost 40% of your investment, this was going to be problematic. But why is it okay to say that I've lost 40% of my students and um, that is okay? And um, the last thing that we thought um, we thought about as we read the case, that was the attitudes that are there. He said, well, um, I can't help it. The students are underprepared. Uh, for reset, um, you know, this is problematic. This attitude needs to change. We need to discuss the root causes of this uh, disparities. Um, and then also the composition of the team that looked at the data and um, tried to read it is problematic because in that uh, team, the student voice is missing. Where is the student to, you know, uh, kind of um, give input as to why is this happening, you know? Uh, Dr. Coutier made a claim, or what I can say, it's his view that the students are underprepared, but what are the students themselves saying? That that voice was missing there. So um, that's in a, in a nutshell, I'll take away. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't see any hands, so I'll pick, oh, UCT. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, our group uh, focused on the second case study. And our key uh, takeaway was to focus on data literacy workshops uh, to unpack and uh, help um, 
everyone understand why we are analyzing this data and presenting the data in this way, and to also help them understand what happens during our data collection process and data analysis steps, and also to help them understand what statistical methods we are using. So to kind of come up uh, to make them understand our data methodology. And that can also help to avoid conflicts. And thank you, Elizabeth, for helping us in the group. Thanks. Okay, V T uh, next. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, my name is Rodney from VUT. Um, we looked at the data set uh, case study, and um, we learned from that uh, case study that uh, there was um, assumptions being made uh, when it comes to looking at the pass rates, because um, Miss Stain actually assumed or made an assumption that because they are actually uh, admitting highly qualified students, that should translate in in good um, uh, pass rates. And then when the, uh, the the data was collected, it shows that uh, uh, it, it, that was not the case. Um, and again, what we've learned that is that um, we should be very careful when it comes to assuming uh, because assumptions uh, in, most, uh, in most cases, when it comes to when you have to prove things by, by the use of data, it's 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 very dangerous. So we we our takeaway there is we should also uh, from our point of view in in terms of uh, from our situation we have a lot of uh, 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 situation where lecturers will assume that because they 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 they've got a bright student from metric and all that and, and they will do better and but when the results come. The, that becomes a shock. So we should base those kinds. Uh, we should base our 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 decision based on on data coming from uh, uh, coming from what uh, the, the, the the what we have collected uh, from our systems. Another thing that we've realized is also communication is very important. How you communicate with them, um, with 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 people who came with such assumptions that. Uh, because they 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 are actually admitting very bright students, then that will translate into uh, better pass rates. Communication is better when we 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 when you communicate with people like that, they need to be uh, shown. They need to be. Uh, we need to have some kind of a presentation where we show the data and disaggregate the data down to. Uh, the student assessment so that they can see actually where is this success where is this pass rate coming from and then they can be able to to understand uh, why they are so uh, the, the i mean the pass rates are so low because it's coming from uh, this aggregating the data down to the assessment um yeah i think my colleagues will also uh, add there if there is any other um, um, uh, points they want to make thank you okay thank you uh, we have the last group, Stellenbosch. Are you still in the room? We are here, but we forgot to um, identify a speaker. So I'll I'll do it. <laughs> um, so we had a look at the the last uh, scenario. Um, and it was quite interesting, I have to say, we felt that we found it very useful that we could discuss this within our institution because um, you know, we're doing a lot of work on this topic at the moment. Um, so I think that the big thing that we said, um, Lomi, I see you're also there, so you should please add on once I'm done, is that, um, you know, student performance will be different because they come from different contexts and there's a lot of different factors that play into this. Um, but the question we discussed was, uh, what can we do? What initiatives, like one of the other, other colleagues said earlier, can we put in place to assist students to, to perform um, better and to be successful in their studies? Um, yeah, Lamri, do you want to add something? No, I don't think I want to add. Thank you, Mahta, for um, giving a summary. I think that the major takeaway from us was it's not good enough to just define all the differences but to go to the next step on, on how do you address that then? Yeah, if I can just also add something, something that came out in previous times when we uh, did these this, uh, presentations or these discussions is that people also feel it's very important to look at the distribution of the pass marks of students because 
you could have quite a, a huge group, just above 50%, that is really at risk. And I also see that a lot of the professional bodies, especially Psyca, like to see the distribution of the marks, to see which students are really very close to failing in a sense. Because just 50 and just over 50 is really close to failing. So it's also very really useful that gives a very good evaluation of how the pulse rate really looks like. Because a couple of students with very high marks can put it up, but actually a very large group can be uh, close to 50% as well. Yes. Just, just for interest sake. Yeah. Um, thank you for all your contribution and for engaging. Uh, is there anyone who also wants to say something, uh, give your last comment? that was not captured and if not, um, what I've gathered as well is from this, I'm gonna shorten it up so that we move to the next case study. Uh, we spoke about equitable uh, support, data literacy, understanding and knowing where your students come from or who your students are in terms of um, the different context. Uh, we need, um, our staff and um, our institution to have a growth mindset that leads to um, improvement. We should not be settling for 60%. And also we need to improve on communication. And that's what I've gathered from today's discussion on this. I hope you can also take it back to your own institution and try and think about how do you improve your own student success initiatives in your own institution. Now we're moving on to the next activity here. Now we're going to be looking at the actual data and I'm going to hand over to Charles um, and then I will come back later. Charles, over. Okay, I just want to get to the resources. Uh, Alan, up. Uh, and I want to look at the one that's completed, the module pass rate template, the completed one, the last one. It will open up in Excel, I saw. Elizabeth, I think the idea is... Uh, Sorry. I just want to... Yeah. Out. Uh, Alan, it opens in Excel. Can you um, check your download? Mine appeared like on the right-hand side of my screen when I did it previously. Let me check on my site. Yeah, it opens up in Excel on the right hand side of the screen. If you click on it, um, I can share it quickly. Where do I share now? Is it at the top of the screen? Uh, it's open now, Charles. Okay, yeah, there it is. Thank you. Okay, the idea is uh, we're going to look a bit at an exercise around the top 10 high, uh, the high risk modules. Now, we did find that institutions define this differently. For some, they look at, at basically modules that are basis, basic modules in first years that are important, like academic literacy. Numer numeracy skills, computer skills. Some universities see that as, as the high-risk modules, but more generally, it's normally uh, modules with very high enrollments with low pass rates because they that impact quite extensively on, on su success rates and especially throughput rates. Uh, but you will see that in the reporting template for Siapumilele, for our reporting to Kreshki, this is also one of the four major student success indicators that we've defined. And the important thing is what kind of interventions do you actually do once you've identified these modules and how you monitor to see whether your interventions are making an impact. But I think for next time, one of the topics, Elizabeth, as I recall, is about data visualization. So 
We are giving you here a completed template, but there's also a blank template in the resources. And the idea is that you go back to your university, that you identify and define how, uh, which are your high impact modules, that you compile information in a way that makes sense for you. This is just an example. And that you bring back that and you can even try to do some visualization of the data that you could use to facilitate discussion of this information and to try to inform interventions. So there it is, uh, just a completed one as an example. Of course, you cannot now answer some of these questions. You will have to go and complete it at your institution. Like the first one, what percentage of your total university module enrollments do the top 10 modules comprise? The top 10 here is the top 10 high-risk ones. And the top five, in which subject areas do students struggle the most? In which modules do students struggle the most? Which student population groups struggle the most, etc. There are a number of questions which you can then answer in your exercise at your institution. But today, for this purpose, you can look at the template, you can, in the group discussions, decide what does this tell you? Look at the data. What, what trends do you pick up? What differences do you pick up? There are some guiding questions below it. And then um, maybe even come back with suggestions of how you can do this better, what will work better for you. For example, some universities really have almost only one population group uh, enrolled at the institution, very few of the others, and you might want a different kind of template or a different kind of discussion. So the idea is go and look at this. Look at what does the data tell you? Does it make meaning for you? What do you see? Uh, where would you like to drill down further? In which way would you like to drill down further? And also come up with suggestions of what can be improved on this kind of template to make it more sensible for you and more useful. I think that's the idea of this next uh, discussions. Thanks. Okay. Yes. So you're going back into the breakout session. You're going to use the same template that Charles has just discussed. I've shared it in the chat. Uh, you will have, I think it's 30 minutes also to uh, go through the template, look at the questions and discuss in detail. And then we will also come back for a repeat report. Yeah, I just note there is one that's empty, but this is the third resource. You just click on the last resource, uh, which is the one with data in so that you can make sense of it. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Um, Ashton, you can open the breakout rooms. Okay, give me 10 Elizabeth and Charles, will you take over, or Charles? Okay, Charles, are you here? We can take over, it's fine. I think everyone is back. Uh, welcome back. Um, we're going to have a, rep a rapid report back. Um, you can elect to go uh, or raise your hand and then I will recognize you, whoever wants to start first, or I'm going to call out the groups and then you do that. Okay, Yunisa, you are up next. Hi, Elizabeth. Yes, so we were having, uh, I actually got cut off when I was trying to make my last contribution. 
But um, I think we had an awesome discussion and um, we very quickly understood what the template was about and we're eager to complete that and, and provide feedback. But we're even more eager, and this is what you've requested, for us to share some ideas on um, other metrics or what we could add to that template and share what we as UNISA are already doing. So um, in a nutshell, I think we're very happy to participate in this exercise. We think the template is a very good foundational template, but we are even more eager to share some other ideas on how we can measure our student success. Thank you. Okay, so there were some couple of questions that were asked. Um, we also interested to know um, in your thinking, because we know um, in previous years, data was not shared across the institution. Um, when you do your feedback, if you were able to get to last point, where we asking who else needs to know about this? Um, we would like to know what institutions have discussed in terms of that as well, right? Um, or other part of the discussions that you had, not just to say our the template is interesting, it's mandatory as part of Siapu Melen. I'm joking, Yunisa, but we love to hear your comment on that as well. So we move on to UJ. Okay, thanks so much, Elizabeth. So yes, so um I think that one of the things we discovered was, first of all, getting to grips with the table and then finding out that once we've discussed the data that was available, how we really wanted more data <laughs> and there wasn't enough in the table for us to really try and understand and, and really have a data mining session to understand what was going on with these different modules. But we said that we wanted to see things, for example, like which of these modules were service modules, because that has meaning in terms of who takes responsibility for interventions if there's a low pass rate? Is it the home or host faculty? And I think that's important to try because that's something at UJ we've discovered recently when trying to revisit what is, you know, looking at pass rates, throughput rates, and now we're looking at progress rates as something entirely different. And we're, we've really discovered that service modules are an area that's a challenge and a hurdle for students. Then we said, what about looking at things like a column linked to the repeaters? Those are the students that are returning. Why are they returning? Is it, it would be interesting to see a trend to see if it's the same modules that, that they're repeating. We wanted to say, we wanted a, a trend of at least three years of those same modules to see if this was something that was, you know, um, becoming a pattern. And if that links to a lecturer or a specific curriculum type or content or what's going on there, is this a pattern? Has it just happened and why? Um, you know, lower pass rates. We wanted to look at... Um, Go students, those students that are actually registered but never came to class versus those that did come to class and just weren't able to understand the content. Did that make an impact on the pass rates? So a column on that. Um, we actually looked at a lot of things. Then we broke it down. I, I, don't, I don't want to talk too much, but just quickly, then we broke it down in terms of the, the race categories and looked at how sometimes it was interesting to see that the African and white, white um, rates were exactly on par and there was a huge difference then with Indian and colored. But then if you look at the number of students enrolled, it skews the data because we're only looking at 10 Indian students versus, you know what I'm saying? So you have to be sure of how data might be skewed in your overall analysis if you look at the actual numbers and break it down. Um, uh, yeah, okay, let me stop there and let other people speak. But it was a very fun exercise. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I guess you didn't get to the last question. Um, oh, yes, no. I did. I could quickly speak to that. Stakeholders, um, if you'll allow me, Elizabeth, so sorry. But we did say you have to speak to the module lecturer. You have to speak to the head of department and how they design the workload. You have to speak to the vice deans and the deans, obviously. And frankly, all of this is probably coming as a directive from the DVC academic. So not, not, I'm, not, I'm not even including your monitoring and tracking division and your academic support division, which usually help with data analysis. So it's actually quite widespread in terms of stakeholders involved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, who wants to go first? Uh, since no one, uh, Stellenbosch. I'm gonna go through the list. Um, yes. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, in in terms of the additional. Uh, variables that we want to look at, uh, we found that students come with different preparation levels. So, for example, if we look at the modules in the economics, we would like to look also at the grade 12 math marks that they come in or the grade 12 average. 
And also language proficiency could also be have a huge impact. So depending on the home language and whether they come in with uh, English first additional language or home language or the preparation that they have in terms of their language proficiency. So we would also like to look at, at those variables. And the others that have been mentioned, for example, if it's a service module or repeat, all these other factors could also be looked at and the trend over the past years. Uh, then I, th I think in terms of uh, who you would discuss with, that could also depend a little bit on the specific faculty. And that would also differ at the university. But you would look at the student affairs officer, you would look at the program coordinator or the module coordinator also. So there are different um, stakeholders involved. But uh, as I said, that could differ from faculty to faculty at Stellenbosch University. Um, other universities, uh, well, Tassisulu. Are you still, yeah. Elizabeth, I was in the group. I can maybe give some feedback. Maybe the people are shy now. Okay, <laughs> can go ahead, Charles. The important thing, if you look at the data, that was clearly just a listing of the highest enrolled modules. It wasn't necessarily high risk modules because some of the pulse rates were quite high. It was clear that especially the modules with numeracy or, or mathematics or numbers included in the curriculum, those were problematic like economics and all quanti quanti uh, quantitative uh, related modules had low pass rates there. But the other point that was made, Yuta also mentioned, it's always important to look at the numbers with the percentages. Mm. I mean, my own institution, for instance, our Indian enrollment is 1%. And if I do throughput rates, then you get the weirdest patterns with the Indian students because simply the numbers, sometimes you've got three or four students in a program. And if all, all four do bad, it looks like the Indian throughput rate is very is terrible, but it's not like that. It differs from year to year. So mm -hmm. it's always important to interpret the numbers with the percentages because percentages can be deceiving in a sense. Um, then, of course, for uh, universities as well as a Sulu, uh, population group makes no sense in terms of the analysis, but Gender is more important. Quintal, even they mentioned students living in their residences and that's uh, studying from home. They are much more meaningful uh, disaggregations for them. So the context is very important for decisions on the breakdown of the data. Um, yeah, and then we also agree with that thing that you need to look at more years of pass rates to actually identify these kind of uh, modules that are problematic. And I love the ideas that UJ gave around the column with repeaters uh, and go students, as she called them, those that never participate. Very good ideas. And, and that, that's what I enjoy about these workshops. We always get a new idea from other people. I know Psycho, for instance, always wants to see the repeater, repeater's pass rates separately when we have to complete those very complex templates of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's what I want to input. We didn't go to all the questions, but there was we had a lot of conversation about how important the background is of yeah. the university or the context, the context. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, VUT. We almost, we almost done, almost, almost, almost there. VUT, are you here? Um, if VUT is still recollecting their thought, UCT, are you ready to present? Yeah, yes, we are. 
Um, so we also uh, looked at mainly the enrollment and compared it with the pass rate to be able to answer most of the questions and just the common trend of it being the uh, quantitative or mathematical um, models that are have the lower pass rates that kind of stood out to us. And then some of the things that we recognized were that um, it could be also useful to then have um, the gender data or data over the past years, which is something that most groups also keyed out. And also understanding where these uh, courses sit at program levels and where they're actually affecting graduation rates uh, for each of the different programs. So that's something that we would also that would be worthy of consideration. And that it will also be important to uh, making sure that lecturers are not necessarily blamed for uh, bad course performance, as um, this won't, necessarily, won't help with their also engagement, engagement with them in terms of understanding what it is that is going wrong uh, within these modules. And then um, also keyed out that it would, it would be important for the student success committees to discuss, and this would include academic advising committees, faculties, Department of Student Affairs, learning designers, et cetera. So those are some of the points that came up in our discussion. Okay. Thank you. And SMU? Um, so we basically followed um, what most of our colleagues have already said here. And what stood out for us when we looked at um, the subject areas where students struggle the most, we identified um, three or four core uh, group of modules, and we thought that they could be even in the same system category there, language being one of them, and then the quantitative kind of uh, the subjects there also is something that uh, stood out, like your quantitative methods and economics. And then the last one was um, the psychology. Um, it seems students uh, struggled a little bit with the, with the psychology modules. But I would just say, but there could be a relationship between those modules. For example, if one is struggling with the languages, it's more likely that they might be struggling with the other modules as well. Um, so um, going to uh, the high impact modules, uh, we thought that addressing the language, this actually addressing those uh, group of modules, the, the, the academic language, the economics and basic uh, side, could um, have an high, a high impact because um, these are first year modules. So if you help them uh, in first years, they're most, most likely going to do well um, in the, in the, in the um, next level. But then we also looked at it in term, not only in terms of the percentage or the pass rate percentages, but we also looked at the uh, unique number of students in there. Um, for example, if you look at the academic language and literacy in English, um, even though it has a, a pass rate of 75%, which is a little bit higher than the others, um, there are 413 students who are doing bad in that module. So addressing that one module alone will should actually uh, reduce or, or rather improve the pass rate uh, university-wide. Um, just going to skip some of the stuff that Ara spoke about. Um, then we go to... What is missing the data and uh, that should be added to add a little bit of understanding? We did say that maybe adding a gender um, uh, dimension to it, just to see if um, there's differences in gender. And then staff, student staff ratio was also one of the things. And then we also thought that the, the formula which is used here says that um, the pass rate is, um, we, we take the number of students that are enrolled uh, minus those that uh, canceled, right? And there we thought that that could be problematic because it hides, uh, it or it might be hiding uh, some factual information there. For example, a student could be in a module for um, some time and then realize that, oh no, I'm doing badly in this module, then um, I'm going to fail it in any case. Then he drops that module. This then means that that student won't be counted. And if we are thinking of student success, then we are leaving out that student. We, we've hidden the problem by simply minusing the student from, um, from the calculations. But um, in actual fact, the student did not do well. And then they decided, no, I'm canceling this mid-semester because I am in, in, in case going to fail. So um, I thought, yeah, the formula might be hiding a little bit of actual data, maybe adding a column there that takes account the number of students that uh, canceled 
could also um, you know, help us understand the bigger picture in terms of how many students, as compared to the original number that enrolled, how many of them actually did complete this module? Yeah, so those are some of the key takeaways from us. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, VUT, anyone? Anyone from VUT? If perhaps you can uh, unmute uh, Mr. Malupe there. Uh, we, I can unmute. They have to unmute themselves. We can only place someone on mute, but not unmute. Um, Mutusi, since you were also part of the discussion, don't you want to continue since we have you here? All right, yeah, even if we couldn't um, finish with all the questions, but our takeaway was that um, it's quite important to actually add some of the variables because if you don't have um, some of the biographical information for those students, um, then we're going to have a problem because if the student um, pass rate is quite low or maybe it's quite high, there are some of the things that will actually add into, into that, like um, your literacy, prof um, literacy proficiency and uh, the number of the dropouts in those um, modules is quite important. And um, having to discuss some of these things, then we need to engage further with um, the stakeholders in the faculties and the program coordinators just to discuss on how actually we can go further with this um, kind of data and even having to, to, to add on those high risk modules, uh, I do believe that we need to, 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 to be available in, in such. Uh, thanks very much, um, colleagues. If anyone again from VUT, then uh, will be able to unmute it, then can add some of uh, the things in there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Is there anyone who has a burning comment or want to contribute to the discussion. There is one thing that was missing and you want to add. No, I just want to comment. I found this thing around the cancellations very interesting because we've also been grappling with that. Um, you can, of course, do two calculations, one with cancellations before examination uh, or one without cancellations, all that enrolled. You can calculate two, two pulse rates. But you also sometimes find that faculties tell us we only want to know those that sit for the exam who pass because they want their pulse rate to look good. But yeah, the other challenge is, of course, a lot of students cancel the modules very early because they find very quickly it's not for them. So I think at some point it will be interesting if it, even if people go and think about this and come back next time and just give their idea around this. Should we leave cancellations out? Should we include them? Maybe we should take cancellations up to a certain point and leave them out. Like those very first few weeks when students decide, no, this model is not for me, or I'm changing a qualification or whatever. It might be correct to leave them out of the final calculation. Just a thought from my side, because it's a tricky one that one. Thanks. Thank you, Charles, for that contribution. Um, uh, you have one last chance to speak now or forever. Nkululek, you're up. Yes, so I think, um, you know, just considering these uh, considerations that have been put forward, I think it aligns with our, our approach at UNISA is to develop platforms or analytics platforms that are as agile as possible allow the academics to apply the context that they believe is important, right? But with great agility comes great complexity as well, because if you have these fancy filters and cross filters that you can apply, uh, it does impact adoption rates and, and colleagues understanding um, how to make use of that. So we, I was to say, we really look forward to the next session where we can showcase how we've dealt with some of these considerations and how we apply agility in delivering the information products that we deliver. Um, so we don't necessarily give fixed templates that we will hand over to an academic or a group of academics. We instead 
will develop Power BI information products that offer the agility to apply the context that you need to source the insight that you believe is most useful to you at whatever level you are operating at within the teaching and learning portfolio. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I also just want to, before we move on to our last segment of the day, is just to wrap um, up the discussion and um, yeah, also to comment on the last point that we 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 had on the questions, the guiding questions, which I think not all of the groups managed to get to that point because I think the discussions were robust with the first few questions that were there. It was around the stakeholders. Who do you think needs to be around the table when you discuss this kind of information? And I think going back to your own institution and thinking about your student success committees or work groups that gets involved in this, um, you might think about when do you like to table such reports to your university? We should not make this reporting as part of um, um, obligation for reporting, for statutory reporting only where we need to report to external funders or we report at Sia Pumelela or we report at DHEAD. We need to engage with the data, but when we engage with this data, like we did today, I hope you will take it at, um, back to your institution and engage even further and try and look at the data in many different ways so that you can understand your student because we cannot understand um, where the challenges are if we're not disaggregating the data. And I think with all the comments that were made today, I think most of us, we can also go back to our institution and look at our reports that we already developed and see how we can improve on it. I like the repeaters, I like the service level mod modules, I like the go students. Um, that was the first time that I hear that terminology as well. Uh, but I also like the fact that we need to understand who our students are. And on that note, I'm handing over back to Charles to give us the last, the next steps. Um, Charles, let's get back. Yes, uh, so we're going to ask you now to go back to your institution to compile uh, such a template on your student success rate. Uh, make it high impact modules if you can and define exactly what you mean with high impact modules. Just for an example, in our university, we use the criteria of three years of a pass rate of 55 and below. But if we just uh, and I, I enrollment is the first first sli slicing. But if we do just that, it's almost all the all the modules that we select to to assist with supplementary instruction is then almost in the business faculty because it's such a massive faculty. So we also add another component that we do it separately in different faculties so that all faculties get support. Just. That's just an interesting way to do it. Another one, as I've indicated this morning, is to look at programs with high enrollments, with low throughput rates, and then identify the modules within them with the lowest pass rates, which are actually preventing the students from graduation. So you, you need to go and, and define your high impact modules, or even just, if you, you don't get to that, if you get to the uh, module success rate analysis that will be meaningful for, for you to take to the stakeholders in the university to actually discuss and identify pro problem areas, try to see what the reasons behind it is and what sort of uh, interventions that you can put in place. Um, and then come back and discuss it with us and showcase what you've done. And if you would like to just do some trying a few graphs on it. Uh, that is what we want you to do for next time. Yeah. Uh, I think that's all from my side. And it is the end resources uh, uh, template, but as uh, we've indicated, go and change the template to something that's relevant for you and that will work for you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yes, so for next week, we expect you to bring back the completed template uh, of module pass rate um, as per Charles' request. 
but we're not saying just stop right there. Um, you can also explore your data um, and also do visualization. But I would not say do the actual visualization for next week. Don't, uh, we still have the last day where you have to come back and showcase because um, next week when we meet, we also go into expand on other um, key performance indicators that we look at um, in Sia Pumelela. And after that, then you will have to come back and, and showcase what your institution is doing in terms of addressing student success and looking at those key indicators. And that will be the last session that we have with you mm -hmm. before you go into the ethics. But for next week, we would like you to go and look at your high impact modules, complete the template, mm -hmm. add um, fields that you want to add. You can also summarize it the way you want to summarize it, uh, either in this tape template or using the graphs or come back with your own institutional visualization. Uh, but I'm, I'm saying don't wow us because then the last week where you have to showcase, you won't have anything to show us anymore. Yeah, it's true, sorry. Um... Next week is only the template and actually try to address those questions below the template. Leave the visualization for the last one. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, Are there any questions, comments, anything that you need clarity on before next week? The template, Alan, if you go up, um, the uncompleted template is the blank one on, you will find it. Yeah, it says blank module pass rate template. That is the one that you're going to work through and bring it next week. And next week we'll be looking so, at that. Um, thank you. I just want to make some comments about why we are looking at key indicators, key performance indicators. In the MOAs that you or your institutions have signed, there are a number of, of these key indicators that have to be uh, given every year of the um, grant. And it is to show that you, there is improvement in student success. In the questions that some of people are asking, we are saying, what kind of um, uh, technology do you use? Do you talk about? Um, different ways of thinking. That is all very good and excellent, but for the re, um, understanding of what Kresge wants is these four indicators to, indi to show that there is a, a uh, change by using data for student success. I, I just want to iterate that because we have found that many people are able to get the data, but sometimes they don't um, integrate it in a way that makes sense about, is it making a difference? So we are going in the next three years to talk quite a lot about this, and we will be talking about it at the convening, which is at the beginning of next month. I just want to, say that it's very important that these uh, key performance indicators are taken seriously because that is what we have to report to Kresge. And it's not us that are saying it. This has been part of Cebu Morella right from the beginning, and it's what the funder wants. So we do need to understand that component. So there was a comment in the question. Um, the template, only one per institution. If you don't have access to the data, um, either your IR department, your business intelligence department, you must send the template to them and ask them. Uh, probably because you do have access to the template today, I will suggest that you distribute it today so that by next week you get it back and be ready for this session. So you get it back as early so that you can prepare and engage. And it will be nice if um, as an institution, before you come to the session, you can also look at the data together and discuss it and look at those guiding questions that we provided you and see 
if they are useful in terms of coming back and giving feedback on your own institutional data. Thank you. Are there any other questions, burning questions, comments? But burning question for me, in order yeah. for us to come together and before we present so that we have a united front as an institution, if you could share the invitees, because for UNISA, for example, we're quite sizable and I see that different colleagues have registered and have been triggered by different uh, people who have reached out to them. If you could share the invite list for UNISA only so that we make sure that we're clear on, or maybe the, 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 the list of colleagues who have registered so that we can get together and, and, and have that united front. Thank you. Uh, um, we do have a... An uh, Excel sheet with everybody. Does it matter that we must send just to your institution or um, Ashton? What I don't know if Ashton is still with us, um, but we will talk about that and see how we give get the institutions components together. So hundred percent. Thank you very much. There's just one more thing that you need to do if you want. The certificate of completion, you need to go to the website. So you need to go to this website and you need to complete the module evaluation. And then there are five questions that you have to answer and then you will get the certificate immediately. If it doesn't, we would really appreciate it if you do this so that we can get some idea about how we can improve our engagement. And Alan, does the evaluation and the certificate completion component expire? Yes. So you have it only has to be done until today. midnight today uh, before it expires. Yep. Thank you. Why why it why are we doing it on the day that we do the workshop is because this is an open uh, website and we don't want thousands of people who do not participate actually getting any uh, information. So you have to be in the system now to do it, and then that's it. Uh, what you will get is the uh, uh, the certificate. And so, and then also give us some feedback. So that's why it's been done this way. And secondly, you as your institution, you can replicate this uh, workshop with anybody in your place, but they don't get the certificate of completion because that's a Sadi Siapumalela component. Any questions? And if there are no questions from me, thank you very much for participating and being part of the session and engaging. I look forward to hearing from you again next week. Thank you. Ciao. Thank, thank you. Looking forward to see what you've done with the data next week. I hope you enjoy it. See you next time. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, and it's been an interesting morning for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.